For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 6b. In this video, I will cover white dwarfs, which are the final outcomes of dead stars such as the Sun. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Let's start off by briefly overviewing the stellar life cycle so we can situate white dwarfs on this schematic. At the beginning of the stellar life cycle, we have a collapsing dust cloud which eventually collapses into a main sequence star. This is a star that's supported by the fusion of hydrogen in its core. Once the core runs out of hydrogen, it will move on to the next nuclear burning phase, which is helium fusion. This phase is called a red giant. Once the red giant's core runs out of helium, if the star is massive enough, it will then fuse carbon, and then oxygen and neon, all the way up to iron, until it eventually explodes in a core collapse supernova. If the star is not massive enough to get all the way to iron, fusion will eventually stop and the star will expel its outer layers in a planetary nebula, leaving behind a white dwarf remnant. And that's the final stage of the star. Now it is possible for the white dwarf to blow up in a type 1a supernova. And finally, the matter expelled in the supernova and the planetary nebula may eventually find its way back into a collapsing dust cloud and the whole cycle starts again. So now let's take a look at white dwarfs in greater detail. Let's start with the red giant phase. So in this case, the star is supported against gravity by the fusion of helium into carbon via the triple alpha process, an alpha particle being a helium nucleus. So three alpha particles, or three helium nuclei, come together to make a carbon-12 nucleus. Once the star runs out of fuel, the core will collapse under gravity until the electrons become degenerate and that will support the star against gravity. The outer layers of the star are expelled in the planetary nebula. The important thing about degenerate matter is that the pressure is independent of the temperature. So once you get to this state where the star is supported by degenerate electrons, contracting the star anymore will no longer raise the temperature. So if the next fusion stage hasn't kicked in by now, it will never kick in because it will never get hot enough. Okay, so the star is supported by degenerate electrons. What does that mean? What is degenerate matter? If we take a look at the energy distribution of normal matter versus degenerate matter, so here we have an energy bin. So you can imagine this is like a well, and the higher up you are in the well, the more energy you have. So normal matter is distributed like this. This is Maxwell Boltzmann gas. This is the type of matter you and I are accustomed to every day. This type of matter obeys things like the ideal gas law. PV equals NKT. So in this case, the pressure depends on the temperature. This pink line here is what's called the Fermi energy. So you can see in this case, almost all the matter is distributed above the Fermi energy. For degenerate matter, almost all of the matter has energy below the Fermi energy. And maybe you have a few particles with a little extra energy. If the temperature were exactly zero, then the highest energy occupied would be the Fermi energy. That's how it's defined. So degenerate matter thermodynamically is the coldest system you can have. And as I said, what's important here is that the pressure is independent of temperature. The pressure is actually caused by what's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is a quantum mechanical effect that says that identical particles cannot occupy the same space. So in this case, the electrons have been crunched together so tightly that they have reached that limit where quantum mechanics says you can't get any more compact. And that's essentially what's providing this degeneracy pressure. If you feel like you need a better understanding of degenerate matter, I covered it in detail in Stellar Physics 4C. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just ask that you please like and subscribe and maybe share it with a few friends. So now that we understand how a white dwarf can support itself against gravity, despite no fusion taking place, Let's take a look at some of the characteristics of white dwarfs. This is the end stage of stars with a stellar mass less than about 10 solar masses. And that's because they're not massive enough to ever get hot enough to fuse all the way to iron. So fusion is stunted prior to iron, iron being the heaviest nucleus you can fuse to in a star. The star then sheds its outer layers in what's called a planetary nebula, leaving behind this white dwarf remnant. White dwarfs have a mass about equal to the mass of the sun, but are only about the size of the earth. So imagine taking all the mass of the sun and crunching it down into a ball the size of the earth. This is an extremely dense object. If you were to take 
one teaspoon of white dwarf material and bring it on Earth, assuming you could do such a thing, it would weigh 20,000 pounds, or 10,000 kilos roughly. Since fusion in a white dwarf will stop somewhere between carbon and iron, the white dwarf is mainly made up of carbon, oxygen, and neon. The exact composition will depend on the initial composition of the star, as well as the actual mass of the white dwarf. The more massive it is, the more heavier nuclei it will contain. So that's basically it. That's the end stage of a star like the Sun. Once you get the white dwarf, there's really not much else it can do. Initially, the white dwarf is very hot. In its core, it will have a temperature somewhere between 100 million and a billion Kelvin. The only thing it can do now is radiate away that energy in the form of light. And that's what's going to happen. The white dwarf is just going to sit there, radiating away all of its energy until it cools down. Now there is one more possibility. If the white dwarf somehow manages to pile on some mass, and its mass eventually reaches what's called the Chandrasekhar limit, it will explode in what's called a Type 1a supernova. I'm not going to cover the Chandrasekhar limit in this video because I covered it in detail in Stellar Physics 4D. So if you want to know about it, you can watch that video. In this video, I'm just going to show you a plot of the radius of the white dwarf at stability versus its mass. So this green line is the relativistic model, and the blue line is the non-relativistic model. The correct model is the relativistic model. The non-relativistic model is an approximation. So we can see here that once you get to the Chandrasekhar limit, which is about 1.4 solar masses, the stable radius goes to zero, which means that a little bit before the Chandrasekhar limit, the star is going to go unstable and collapse. But wait, I just said the star was going to explode, which is the opposite of collapsing. Well, it collapses and then explodes. And this explosion is called a Type 1a supernova. So how does this work? Once the white dwarf approaches the Chandrasekhar limit, the star is going to go unstable and collapse. The extreme density, and hence extreme energy contained, will trigger a rapid burst of carbon fusion. This is called a carbon flash. In reality, we don't fully understand how this carbon flash is set off, but we have a general idea of how it should work. We just don't have the details quite worked out. So qualitatively, this is what happens. The extreme density of the white dwarf means there's a lot of energy confined in the white dwarf. The way you can think about this is it takes an enormous amount of energy, which is provided by gravity in this case, to crunch all this matter together into such a dense object. So near the Chandrasekhar limit, this high density in energy sets off carbon fusion, releasing heat and increasing the temperature. Well, normally, this would increase the pressure. But in this case, the star is supported by degeneracy pressure, which does not depend on temperature. So increasing the temperature has no effect on the pressure. For a normal star made up of normal matter, you increase the temperature, that increases the pressure, and the star now expands. As it expands, it cools down until it finds a nice equilibrium where the pressure balances the gravitational forces. But since we have degenerate matter, increasing the temperature does not increase the pressure, and so the white dwarf cannot cool or release that energy via thermal expansion. Now that there is even more energy trapped in this white dwarf, that just increases the fusion rate, releasing even more energy. But still, we have degenerate matter, and this has no effect on the pressure, and so still the white dwarf cannot release this energy. Eventually, you may get enough energy to fuse oxygen, releasing even more heat. Now you have carbon fusion and oxygen fusion taking place, and again, this extra energy only serves to further increase the fusion rate, and eventually you get an enormous explosion. Now this whole process I just described happens very quickly, hence the term carbon flash. As I said, we don't fully understand the details of how this explosion is set off, but it's something like what I just described. So this explosion, which is the Type 1a supernova, releases an enormous amount of energy. Its peak luminosity is 10 billion times as bright as the sun. The total energy released in a Type 1a supernova is about equal to all the energy released by the sun in its entire lifetime, which is 10 billion years. But in the case of this supernova, this energy is released in a period of about a month. So this is a massive explosion. A Type 1a supernova is one of the brightest things in the universe. And this explosion 
just obliterates the white dwarf. Now, Type 1A supernova, apart from being extremely massive explosions, are very important to astronomers. And that's because they're always exactly the same. Because they're all set off at the Chandrasekhar limit, so 1.4 solar masses, with basically the same composition for exactly the same reason. So every Type 1A supernova you see is exactly the same. And that means they can be used as what's called standard candles. A standard candle is just some astronomical object that has a known brightness. And so you can use it to measure absolute distances. Because if you see one, you know exactly what its luminosity is. And based on how bright it looks on Earth, you can figure out how far away it was. Here I have a plot of the light curves of a bunch of different Type 1a supernovae. As you can see, they all basically follow the exact same pattern. On this axis, I have the change in luminosity relative to the peak. Don't pay attention to the actual units on this axis. All you need to know is that this is a log scale. And on the x-axis here, on the horizontal axis, we have time in units of days after the peak. So you get this extremely bright peak, which rapidly decays over a period of about a month and a half or so, and then it slowly fizzles out. And every single Type 1a supernova looks exactly like this, especially in this peak area. So that's why these explosions are extremely useful for measuring distances to astronomical objects. So here is a famous picture of a supernova that went off in the outskirts of this galaxy. Here we have the supernova. It's pretty much as bright as the center of this galaxy, which has billions of stars in it. And by looking at the light curve, we were able to see that this was in fact a Type 1a supernova, which then allows us to figure out how far away this galaxy is. Now, I don't know in this case, maybe it was already known how far this galaxy was. If so, the Type 1a supernova will allow you to verify that. So that covers white dwarfs. This is the final outcome of stars with a stellar mass less than about 10 solar masses. So the sun will end probably as a cold white dwarf. The sun doesn't have a companion star, so it's unlikely it will be able to pile on mass to go supernova. In the next video, we're going to look at what happens for stars larger than 10 solar masses, and we're going to cover core collapse supernovae. So if you found this video interesting and you'd like to see the next one, be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified for future videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.